excellent tips, Eileen. I have to second that. I agree. I'm going to find, find that YouTube video myself and continue to have that playing in my brain when I'm given the choice for cake or apples. I'll try to reduce. Anyway, um, I am very uh, happy that Bobby asked me to come and give this short presentation to you today. I will begin sharing my screen. Natalie, you might want to introduce yourself just a hair more that, uh, you know, where you come from and what your role is there. Will do. Um, so my name is Natalie Smith. I am the Child and Family Program Director at Ravenwood Health. Ravenwood is a uh, behavioral health facility in Geauga County, which is Northeast Ohio, the suburb just to the east of Cleveland. Um, and I have been our intensive home-based treatment coordinator for 15 years. Uh, everyone who works at Ravenwood knows that this is my baby. My, the program that I love the most is IHBT. I'm very dedicated to it and its principles. So I am excited to talk to you today about creative solutions for multi-system youth. Um, so a little bit more just about Ravenwood Health. So again, we're the largest provider of behavioral health services in Geauga County. We have a full continuum of care from prevention to residential services from ages four through the lifespan. Why that's important in this presentation is oftentimes our IHBT program uses our adult services in creative ways. And so we recognize that we are fortunate to also be the agency that houses a lot of unique and creative programs, both for children and adults. Um, I hope that you can take some of the information that I present and if you don't have these services within your own agency, you know, partner with other agencies around you that may have access to some adult services because it is really neat to partner child serving IHBT with adult serving programs when it's indicated. So High Fidelity IHBT has been at Ravenwood since 2006. We enjoy strong community connections because we have a high success rate. In the 15 years we've been running this program, we have never dipped below 86% of children remaining in their homes. Um, at time of discharge from IHBT. So in the last two years, our outcome has been 96% of kids remaining in their homes. So high rate of success. Five years ago, our agency implemented a medication assisted treatment program. And we have a huge SOAR grant funding for that project. That will become important here in a minute. So I wanna tell you a little bit about the family that I'm presenting on today and, and talk to you about our specific case presentation. So the initial referral for services um, came to our IHBT program from our local child protective services. And this is sort of a frequent referral that comes to intensive home-based, right? The identified client was a 12-year-old girl residing actually with her great-grandmother. Great-grandmother was in her early 80s um, and the 12-year-old and her 10-year-old younger sister living in this home, but the 12-year-old girl was displaying with oppositional and unruly behaviors, including physical aggression towards the great-grandmother. And that was the reason for um, child services involvement in the family's life. They get referred to intensive home-based. And during our assessment, um, very comprehensive assessment in, involving all members of the family, not just the family that resides in the home, but whoever is identified as family by the family unit, um, it became known to us that the children's mother, who was a recovering opiate user, was very involved in the children's lives and had been making efforts to regain custody. So we started looking at what are some creative treatment options we could offer this family because the great grandmother's health was starting to decline. It didn't actually appear as though remaining with the custody of the great grandmother was going to be the best outcome for the family. So we decided to combine, fully combine for this family, our IHPT program and our medication assisted treatment program. And we determined that if we provided a comprehensive treatment approach that included, you know, formal, oops, didn't mean to go to the next slide yet, that included formal, formal and natural treatment approaches as well as putting together the long-term plan for increasing the family connectedness and sobriety maintenance, that's where we would have the most success. So we asked our children's services, we presented the plan back to our children's services and said, what do you think about us 
presenting to the court system that we would actually like the children to live with their mother. Um, and we would reunify the children to the mother and make that their identified family unit for IHBT. And we would look at everything else from the lens of how to increase the attachment between parent and child and make that the long-term solution. That was actually initially met with a lot of resistance because mom at that point was about eight months sober. So she did not have what the court determined was long-term sobriety. Um, there was also a very active children's case plan you know, in the court system at that point. Mom was involved in drug court, but we felt strongly that that was the best option for the family. That again, great grandmother was getting older. It was gonna be more important to return great grandmother to a rightful role of grandmother in the family system and begin looking at options for mom. So we identified a lot of goals, a lot of needs, and luckily for us, there were a lot of strengths in the family unit. And we start any of our assessments with looking at these three areas. What are the goals? What are the needs? But more importantly, what are the strengths? What do we already have available to us that we can build off of? Um, we really identified the goals as, the IHPT goal was to increase parent and child attachment. The idea was we were gonna decrease externalizing oppositional and aggressive behaviors. That the 12 year old in the family system would stop using physical aggression as a main, main way to regulate emotion. Mom needed a sobriety maintenance program. That was clear, it was necessary for the family. But we also had to develop a plan to meet the basic needs of the family, financial stability, housing. When we met the family, mom's housing was very tenuous. That was part of the reason why she, was, she had been unable to regain housing at that time. So the needs really were how to find housing, how to help mom gain income. We had to realign the family subsystems. That means put mom back in her rightful role as parent, put grandma back in her rightful role as grandparent, and how do we help them support each other through that change? How do we improve family communication? Why the, parent, why the children were living with great grandmother? This was a family system where addiction had touched all generations and all levels. Family communication tended to be very secretive, tended to be very argumentative. So we had to look at a plan to improve family communication on all levels. And then we really had to help the, the children, but all family members in general, develop regulation skills. Once we got involved with the family more, while the 12 year old had very externalizing behaviors of outward aggression, angry outbursts, we identified that the 10 year old had some internalizing behaviors and actually had developed suicide plans and self injurious behavior. So a lot of goals on a lot of needs on all different levels. And we were gonna manage a, a, a transition to a new school district if we put them with mom. So there was a lot to look at, but we had a lot of strengths. This was a family motivated to this plan. They instantly agreed with the plan. They wanted to make this plan work. So they were motivated to strengthen their family bonds. And that was key for us. There was a high level of treatment compliance. Um, this was a family that had already developed family activities and rituals that we could work with. Family togetherness time was important to them. S sectioning out family rituals were important to them. Family celebrations, um, gratitude in the family was very important. So we had a lot to work with. They were also active in their faith community. So they already had one for natural support that we could use and activate pretty quickly in the system. So how did we overlap the programs? This was the biggest challenge was really overlapping every single thing that was available to us. Um, in our MAT program, this is what the family was receiving weekly. So this was a lot. The family, the, the mom was receiving individual therapy, group therapy, drug screening, medication management. She was in our Suboxone program. Um, she was receiving peer support. But most importantly, our first step in the plan was to put her into recovery housing. So through our SOAR grant, we have two recovery houses within our network. They're duplexes and they are designed to help mothers and their children. So each unit accepts a mom and two kids. And wasn't it lucky for us that we had a mom and two kids? The problem was that we had a 12 year old and actually our recovery housing was only up to age 11 um, because when they wrote the grant, it was determined that the teenagers might be too difficult to manage in recovery housing. I don't know what they were thinking. Teenagers are so easy to manage. But so we talked to our recovery housing director and said, 
but this family will be in IHBT. We can pretty much guarantee you that we will be there every day. If there's a problem, we will make it work and we will manage it. So luckily we got accepted into our recovery housing. And that is actually where the family is still living today is in recovery housing. IHBT came in and became the lead case manager. Obviously that's a role of IHBT is to be the lead case management in any family that we take in for services. But in this case, it was even more important to be the lead case manager and be able to direct kind of what was happening in all facets of the case. IHBT was primarily responsible for providing the family therapy, crisis response, of which there was a lot. Um, in the first part of the reunification, I do believe that we were at the family's home daily. Um, the 12 year old continued to struggle with the adjustment, continued to show externalized aggression and anger, um, even ran away a couple times in the neighborhood. So we were there often, often for um, crisis response. We provided a lot of parent coaching, um, a lot of parent coaching to mom, helping her understand you know, positive discipline for parenting and recovery, how to establish the attachment with her children, just a real big emphasis on parent coaching and then social skill development for the children. A lot of emotion regulation, social skill development. That, those were the jobs of IHBT. Then we utilized all of our family, formal and natural supports. So we had child protective services involvement throughout. Mom was involved in drug court. We utilized our school district. And then we utilized our family and children's first council to access funding for the children. We recognized very early on that one of the biggest concerns of the children was whether or not mom was going to overdose and what were they going to do. That was something that they had witnessed and seen in the past. So we creatively brainstormed that if we could get the children signed up for babysitting classes and CPR and first aid training, that they would actually feel confident that they had some skills in just a general safety arena if something were to happen in the home environment. So we strengthened their confidence and strengthened their sense of self-esteem around sort of basic family safety issues. We created safety plans in the home that didn't just talk about behavior. We created safety plans in the home that talked about how do you call 911? How do you um, access external supports if you need them? Do you know your address? Do you know where you're living? Do you know how to access extra services? So that became a big component of the treatment plan was how to ensure family safety and we utilized our formal and natural supports to help make that happen. We also utilized a, a great amount of family respite. Once all the additional family members, some aunts, some cousins, and great-grandmother specifically, was put back into the role of extended family member instead of primary caregiver, they became natural respites. So the girls would get to go to grandma's, would get to go to aunts or cousins when mom was attending group therapy or was attending any of her 12-step meetings. So I wanted to focus a little bit on the trauma-informed care that we use at Ravenwood. Our entire treatment philosophy and in our intensive home-based program is based on trauma-informed care. Um, all the IHPT therapists that are part of the program are actually certified trauma and resilience practitioners through the National Institute for Trauma and Loss in Children, which is STAR Global. Not sure how many of you are familiar with that program, but that is the program that we use here at Ravenwood. It is a program that talks a lot about trauma as a sensory experience. And that before we can do cognitive work on our trauma, we have to identify it as a sensory experience. It's just a trauma program that really works for us. It just really works for helping kids and parents understand how trauma lives in their bodies and how they can work through it themselves by engaging their own social engagement systems and things like that. Um, our program in general and our entire agency utilizes this trauma-informed approach. We we have a motto in the department, you know, become a witness to our client's experience, have our clients identify the trauma. We don't have to identify the trauma. And that's actually where the babysitting classes and first aid classes came from, is the child, we, you know, you would think that the, the um, trauma for the child was the removal from the home environment. You would think that the trauma for the child was witnessing, you know, mom in jail, because they had 
gone to visits with their mom in their early, you know, school age years, visiting mom in jail, things like that. You would think that was a trauma, but they absolutely identified it was fear of an overdose. That is our trauma and that's what we need skills for. So it's about becoming a witness to our client's experience. Our program focuses on building resiliency through connections, independence, mastery, and contributions. Those are the four quadrants of the circle of courage, which is a resiliency model that the National Institute teaches. Um, we also in our program secondarily use components of trust-based relational intervention. So trust-based relational intervention is an evidence-informed program that comes out of Texas Christian University. It was originally founded by Dr. Karen Purvis, and her program was specifically designed for attachment disordered youth who were or, um, potentially in the foster care system. But we love this program, and we think it works so well for our children in our IHBT program who've been exposed to significant trauma histories. It focuses on empowering, connecting, and correcting principles. So one of the unique parts of trust-based relational intervention is you're not teaching the parent that they have to have clear, consistent structure and routines from a behavioral perspective. You're teaching the, the, the family that you have to have clear, consistent structure and routines because that endorses an opportunity for felt safety. It's an empowering principle that in trauma-informed care, we wanna be predictable and we wanna be consistent with our, with our children. So it's just a, it's a trauma-informed program for the parents as well. And the goal of intervention is playful engagement rather than discipline and consequences. Um, the program endorses connect before you correct. It's a lot about the compassion and the nurturing prior to a discipline approach. Um, finally, our agency focuses on motivational interviewing and harm reduction for all our substance use disorder treatment programs. So that was very important for us to know in order to blend the two models of the trauma-informed motivational interviewing and substance use. So how did we do that? Like, how did we really blend these two programs? Well, every other week we had internal treatment team meetings. So that was just for the providers within the facility. It was for the people who were providing IHBT. It was for the individual therapist, the group therapist, and even our peer support. So we would have internal meetings every other week where we just talked about, were we presenting the same goals to the family? Were we presenting the same needs to the family? Were we using the same language? Did our treatment approaches gel together? Did they connect? Did they make sense? And then once a month, we actually had family team meetings. So that's where mom was involved, great grandma was involved, our collaterals were involved. And so once a month, we would talk about how is treatment going? Have we met all of our goals for the month? Are we again connecting on all the larger levels? Are we seeing how all the external systems are at play for this family? So where are they now? Where are they now? Well, IHPT involvement was May 2020 to February 21, 2021. So they've been discharged from the IHPT program for a couple of months. I do have to note here, what's very important is that this family was less impacted by COVID than any of the other families in our IHPT program during the same time period. So there were multiple times during that exact time period that our IHPT program here at the agency was going from virtual to hybrid to in-person to virtual to hybrid to in-person. Because this particular family was living in our own housing, we had some level of control over the safety measures. We knew how often the house was being cleaned. You know, we knew just lots of different things that were going on in the actual house itself. So we could still provide this service home-based, face-to-face. I think that matters. I'm not sure. We only needed one extension for this case. And some of that was due to the transition in the school district. We really wanted to make sure the IHPT team was very focused on ensuring that the child's educational needs were taken care of as they moved from school district to school district. The child is on an IEP, the older child is on an IEP, and we wanted to make sure that was effectively managed. And because the school year was sometimes virtual, sometimes hybrid, sometimes in person, the school part of the case actually got a little bit tricky at times. Um, but I, I'm not sure how well this case would have gone if we had not been able to provide the home-based intervention in person. Not sure. 
because our MAP program also never went fully virtually. Those clients we deemed too risky to put in a virtual format. So the program was delivered in person. I think it's important to note that. Um, but since the date of the family's successful discharge, they've been involved in lower intensity outpatient supports. So we're just continuing the theme of IHBT only on a lower intensity level. Both children are involved in TBS services. The family remains involved in bi-weekly family counseling. So every other week they're having a family therapy appointment. Mom still participates in MAT. It was very important to us to get the children involved in extracurricular activities at the school to en enhance their sense of community with their new neighborhood. Um, they remain active in their faith community. The faith community was active throughout. It, that was something that did take a back seat during IHBT, but mostly because the church was um, only participating in virtual services at that point, but we were connected to the pastor and, and used him on the natural support treatment team. Um, the relationships with extended family members are supportive. And during our time of IHBT, Child Protective Services backed out, Juvenile Court backed out. And so to, to this day, they have had no new involvement in either of those services. And both children are attending school and doing well. So I hope that was a um, indication of just how uh, you could blend both programs. That was an 